the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, one God, Amen. Brothers and sisters in Christ with the most humble of hearts, greetings to you all. I hope everybody's doing well. Glory be to God for giving us this wonderful time to praise Him, to honor Him, and of course to learn from Him. By the grace and will of God, today we'll be discussing the traditions of the Ethiopian and the, or the Eritrean Orthodox Tawaru Church, specifically iconology. The moment anybody walks into the Ethiopian and the Eritrean Orthodox Tawaru Church, the very first thing that they notice is the iconology, these beautiful icons that are all around the church that are mesmerizing, that would grasp our attention, our sight. Holy icons are a holy depiction of our God, the Holy Virgin Mary, the saints, and of course the angels. They're drawn in two dimensions, on top, on, on a canvas, it could be on animal skin, which is what we call brannam, it could be all throughout our scriptures and we also see them on top of the crosses that the priest and the deacons would hold. Now these beautiful holy icons bring the scripture back to life giving us a better understanding of the past. It's like taking uh, a trip back down memory lane. Uh, you know, we go back thousands of years appreciating everything that was given to us by our forefathers and the fathers before them, the apostles and the beautiful first century Christians uh, who you know gave us this beautiful treasure that we have today and we often are marveled by this and we appreciate everything that was given to us but for a lot of people who are not part of our church people who are not part of this beautiful community often question us like what do you guys have these things and the moment they question us often we we become very fragile we start doubting ourselves we start you know questioning ourselves and that is because we do not know the things that we do, why why we do the things that we do, and why we have the things that we have within our church. And for that, it is important to understand and to study and to question everything about our church so that we give a better answer to these people who do not understand. Yes, the question that they arise is like, why do you guys have this? Doesn't the Bible warn against this? Doesn't the Bible say not to have graven images? Are you guys worshiping these things? Doesn't Exodus chapter 20 verse 44 talk about how not to make graven images of things of the heavens, of things on earth, of, of things that are underneath the waters? because God is a jealous God? Yes, of course, the scripture says that, but it's not talking specifically talking about the holy icons that we have within the church. And for this, we must have a proper answer. We know that everything that we do within our church is the truth, but we do not know exactly where to point to, what to point to, so that they have a better understanding. So with, without being uh, hostile, without being confrontational, we can easily answer those questions if we understand the scripture, the traditions of the Ethiopian and the Eritrean Orthodox Tawado Church. And the very first thing that people need to understand or people do not understand our traditions is everything that we do is biblical. So the reason why we have iconology is not is not because we wanted to or we like pictures or we like arts. It's because God commanded it to, to, to do so, for us to have it so. And we see this back in the Old Testament when God first, you know, ordered Moses to build the sanctuary so that he may dwell amongst his people and he told them exactly how to build it and what to have within it as well so if we read Exodus chapter 36 and Exodus chapter 37 two chapters it talks about how God commands him to make uh, the icon of cherubim and the mercy seat so we find Moses putting uh, cherubim the icon of cherubim on either side or on either end of the mercy seat and people worshiping within that tabernacle as well when we see one chapter ahead in chapter 37 37, we also find Moses putting these icons, uh, you know, the embro embroiderment on top of the curtains and not just that on top of the Ark of the Covenant as well. And not just that, this is how we know it's God's will as well. When we read 1 Kings chapter 6, verse 23, where King Solomon, who built the very first temple, he built it in the way God wanted to. And within the, the temple that he had built, there is holy icons on the curtains. Of course, there were icons on um, on the Ark of the Covenant as well, and then all throughout the, the tabernacle and on top of the mercy seat as well. So this is the commandment of God. It's not like we are contradicting God's will. Uh, uh, we are actually following what He told us to follow. If you say that we are contradicting God, it's as if saying God is contradicting Himself. So if God says to put these icons uh, in the mercy seat or in the tabernacle, let's follow this commandment rather than question it. God wanted us to have this and he told Moses specifically to have that within the tabernacle that he has and secondly the apostles passed down uh, another significant icon to us we know Saint Luke to be uh, a physician a great apostle of our Lord and our Savior Jesus Christ uh, besides his 
a wonderful preaching evangelism, he also drew the icon of the Holy Virgin Mary holding our Lord and our God uh, and our Savior Jesus Christ. And not just that, in the very first, in the, in the first century, uh, the beloved disciple of Jesus Christ, St. John, we know him to be one of his, his favorite disciples who loved Jesus Christ so much after his, after his you know, persecution, crucifixion, resurrection, and ascension, he still wept about the, pers the persecution that our Lord and our Savior Jesus Christ went through. He wept the rest of his life, not wanting to smile, not desiring to feel any type of joy, remembering what was sacrificed for his salvation, so that he remembers this moment he drew the crucifixion. He gave us the icon of our Lord and our Savior Jesus Christ on top of the cross. So this was passed down to us, uh, the passed down to us, so that we may keep it, we may see it, and we under we have a better understanding of the past. So it's not a random tradition that we came up with. Uh, it's a tradition. Uh, a sacred tradition that was passed down to us from our forefathers from the moment and from the Old Testament days to the New Testament days to you know to thousands of years ago from from our forefathers up until this moment and the other question that we must confidently answer to anybody that would question us is that are we worshiping these images or holy icons we are not worshiping we are simply venerating this beautiful icons that we have we are venerating the saints that are on top of the holy icons worshiping is uh, it's like equivalent uh, to replacing god with something that is created uh, something with you know that people are passionate about something other than God. So we are not you know switching God where we're not you know replacing God. We are simply venerating uh, the people that are we're giving respect to God's soldiers. For example, the moment we see you know for example for, for a lot of us who live in the Western world, the moment we salute a soldier, we are giving honor to the country. We are honoring them. We're saluting them because they serve they serve and protect the country. So the moment we are saluting. Or we're venerating the saints we are honoring God as well so us saluting a soldier does not take away the honor of the country and us saluting or giving veneration to the saint does not take away from the glory of God because they are soldiers of God the reason why we salute the soldiers is because they they fight for the country that we live in the reason why because they fought for our Lord, they fought for their God, they gave their life away so that they can glorify God. So for that, we appreciate them. And of course, when we read the book of Proverbs chapter 10, verse 7, it talks about having a remembrance uh, and having a veneration of the righteous is a blessing to us. And not just that, when we read the book of Psalm chapter 34, verse 15, it talks about this. The eyes of the Lord are on the righteous and his ears are open to their crime. The face of the Lord is against those who do evil. Not just that, to cut out, to to cut off the remembrance of them from this earth. Two things I want us to notice here. The very first part is that the eye of the Lord is on the righteous and his ears are attentive to their crime. The second part that I want us to notice is that uh, he, his eyes are away from wicked people or people who do evil and not just that he wants to erase their remembrance from this earth. Giving us an idea, giving us an understanding that he wants the righteous people to be remembered just as indicated in Proverbs chapter 10. The remembrance of a righteous is a blessing to us. And of course, these holy icons have this beautiful blessing with them, remembering them before them and having them all around our homes and our prayer uh, and our prayer areas within our churches is a blessing to us. This beautiful veneration that we have gives us a blessing as well. Let alone the saints, let alone the saints. When we read the, the book of Revelation chapter 13, it talks about how uh, the, the beast would make an image and would force people to bow down to that image. Anybody, and, and anyone that would not bow down to that image would be forced to kill. Now, image, this Im image talks to people, speaks and does wonders. If the image of a, the devil can do some wondrous things, how much things, how much more can the saints and the angels do based off of the, the veneration that we can possibly do before the, the, the holy icon? So this is something that you know, we need to keep in mind as well. God can do wondrous things through holy icons, which he also instructed us to have within, within our church. Uh, secondly, it's important for us to understand holy icons teach us our history as well. I mentioned it in the beginning as well. This is something that we need to remember and understand as well. Back in the days, you know, you know, the there was no uh, 
proper canon up until the 4th and the 5th century. And before that, a lot of people did not even have the scripture to begin with. Let alone to have the scripture, it was not translated into anything. There is no printing presses. So there was very little copies. Imagine how people struggle to understand the gospel. So for a lot of people, one, who didn't have the luxury of having the, the scripture, and two, for people who are who are illiterate, these images, these holy icons were the one that was giving them the good news. So it was a great way to spread the gospel as well. So it was bringing the gospel back to life and it was making, uh, it, was making it easy for a lot of Gentiles to have a, a better understanding of the church, better understanding of salvation as well. So this is the reason why our churches have it. So uh, this is, it's a beautiful way to be part of history. Uh, the third thing is holy icon give us a great understanding of theology. They're not just random drawings or paintings of the church. These uh, holy icons have specific way of drawing specific things that are on, on the uh, iconology. And that's something that we need to notice as well. Uh, for example, when we look at the Ethiopian Orthodox Sohwato Church, we have, you know, of course, we have our own alphabet we have our own melody that was given to us by saint yari the, the greatest composer of all time a composer even before beethoven and, and all those people that that we hear of the greatest composer of all time is saint yari so we have our own hymn so we have our own way of uh, worshiping, we have our own traditions of the church. So, uh, as we have all those, we also have our own way of uh, depicting or having holy icons, iconology, and that's some, uh, something to, to notice. The very first thing that we need to understand is all our holy icons are drawn in two dimensions. Secondly, there's only six colors that are used on our holy icons. First white, second black, third green, then yellow, then we have red, and then lastly we have blue. Nothing is beyond that that nothing less as well so we use these six colors to depict to uh, have this holy depiction of holy icons within our church and the most of course significant uh, significant uh, icons within the churches that we have as you know the Holy Trinity our Lord and our Savior Jesus Christ the Holy Virgin Mary uh, we have uh, the Saints we have the angels as well these are the most significant one the very first one is the the depiction of the the Holy Trinity and not uh, no other churches, not, not not even Oriental churches, have the Holy Trinity, the, the Holy Icon of the Holy Trinity. The Holy Trinity is uh, uh, depicted as an elderly man, and that is because they are rich in, in time and in wisdom as well. And not just that, that when they appeared in the home of Abraham, we know them to be as el uh, elderly men. So because of that, we draw them or we... I cannot, you know, we uh, depict them in that way as an elderly man because they are rich in wisdom and rich in time and because they appeared uh, in the house of Abraham as three elderly men. Then we have our Lord, our God, Jesus Christ as well. Of course, all of his works are depicted all throughout the, the church, all throughout the sanctuary, but the most important ones are his birth, of course, and then his theophany, which is the baptism, uh, the baptism time, then the crucifixion and the ascension as well. So whenever our church draws uh, the the icon of his birth there is always you know our our Lord and our Savior Jesus Christ as a baby uh, with his mother Saint Joseph and animals all around him in a barn very important and theophany it's important for our Lord and our Savior Jesus Christ to be in the river of Jordan being baptized by Saint John surrounded by clouds the father above the clouds and the Holy Spirit hovering above him as a dove very important and then we have the crucifixion with the crucifixion we have our Lord and our Savior Jesus Christ on top of the cross with the two uh, criminals on either side, the Holy Virgin Mary and St. John alongside him with the five nails that, that were used to crucify him, his head tilted to the right uh, with his sides, uh, uh, you know, speared that, that wound is being there, water and blood coming out of it and the, mood, the moon being red, no stars, no sun. And that's how we, the, way, the way we draw the holy icon of the crucifixion. Then we have the ascension with the tomb still closed, full, four soldiers uh, sleeping and our Lord and our Savior Jesus Christ, you know, dressed in white as well. Then we have the Holy Virgin Mary, the holy icon of the Holy Virgin Mary. She is drawn, of course, holding her son, our Lord and our God, Jesus Christ. She's always to the right because in Psalm chapter 44 talks about how she would be sitting to the right of him. And of course, she will be uh, wearing a blue robe 
with her hair all covered because that's a sign of virginity and the red dress because she held uh, divinity within her womb uh, and then of course uh, she will be drawn knitting uh, knitting a garment with gold with gold alongside it with the angel saint gabriel giving her the good news that's the way we depict the holy virgin mary and then we have the saints the saints are usually drawn carrying a cross or carrying the gospel depending on the work that they have done for example uh saint taklamon will be drawn with six wings with uh one of his legs missing uh, uh in all, all these things and then we have the angels as well the angels are drawn in two ways the first we have the archangels the archangels will be holding crosses and swords and that is because as you know uh mentioned in genesis chapter 48 they are sent for good they are sent also for punishment so they're they're holding the cross because they come for mercy they <laughs>